even before embracing Islam, I've always had this desire to write a book. I don't know why I always had this desire to write a book. And I said, one day I'm going to write a book. And subhanAllah, when I became Muslim, I would say after the first two years of Islam, I said, I have to write a book to help people like myself. You know, and this is like quite some time ago that I made this decision to help people like myself who are new Muslims to understand the struggles that a new Muslim goes through, to help them to basically not go through the same problems that I've gone through or make the same mistakes that I have. That was one of the intentions of the book. And the second was to help the community, the existing Muslim community, to basically know how to deal with new Muslims, to understand the struggles that new Muslims go through, especially in the, in the West. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to the Realist Podcast in the dunya, the three Muslims you are joined with. Only two out of the three. Fired <laughs> myself and Anha. But today we got Gabriel, brother Gabriel, to cover for Rami. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, how's it going today? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, man. Everything is good, mashallah. Early morning in Malaysia. Okay, okay. Nothing to complain, right? Alhamdulillah. As we always say, if you if you have time to complain, you have too much free time. <laughs> That's right, man. So today That's I heard uh, there's uh, there's a rumor around the street that we got a new book, right? Journal of a New Muslim. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Tell me a little bit yes. about that. Taib Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu Rasulillah. Yes, Alhamdulillah. This is something I've been working on for quite some time. Subhanallah. I remember even before embracing Islam, I've always had this desire to write a book. I'm horrible at writing, by the way. That's like one of my problems as I went through my uh, schooling as a child. Teachers always complain about my the legibility of my writing, like handwriting and the way I would write. I think also that I've been exposed to quite a few different languages. It was difficult for me to get the grammar correct and all that. You know, so I would like kind of mess it up. But I don't know why I always had this desire to write a book. And I said, one day I'm going to write a book. And subhanAllah, when I became Muslim, I would say after the first two years of Islam, I said, I have to write a book to help people like myself. You know, and this is like quite some time ago that I made this decision to help people like myself who are new Muslims to understand the struggles that a new Muslim goes through, to help them to basically not go through the same problems that I've gone through or make the same mistakes that I have. That was one of the intentions of the book. And the second was to help the community, the existing Muslim community, to basically know how to deal with new Muslims, to understand the struggles that new Muslims go through, especially in the, in the West. All right, there's a lot of communities, Muslim communities in the West, they have still quite a strong culture um, and they sometimes don't understand where an American or a Canadian or whatever new Muslim comes from or what are the challenges that they go through. So basically, it's yeah, like two parts. So one for the new Muslims to help them with their problems. And the second one for the existing Muslim community to know how to deal with the Muslim, new Muslims and to understand. Because sometimes they judge, they jump to conclusions without really knowing the background or the struggles that they're coming through. So that's what I hope to do with this book. To, to help. So I really pray that more new Muslims read it and more community leaders and masjid activists who have the new Muslim programs or who deal with converts, you know, who go to their masjids to become Muslim, know how to deal with them, inshallah. So yeah, alhamdulillah, that's pretty much the, the background behind the book. I can say for myself, so, I'm definitely yeah. getting it because I want to know more about how to deal with new Muslims. I think I was going to say Anho's going to get it because he's a new Muslim himself, but I think it's been a couple months, man. I don't consider you a new Muslim anymore. Right. I'm, I'm 
I'm definitely a new Muslim still. You're definitely a new Muslim. Yeah. Gabriel, how do you <clears throat> distinguish between a new Muslim, like a new revert, and to when they're no longer considered a new Muslim? Okay. That is a good, uh, very good question. I, I don't think there's like a cutoff point in terms of time because everyone deals with it differently and enters into the faith differently. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, He says, all oh, you believe, enter in the faith fully, right? So basically, as some of the Mufassirin say, like accept everything, right? So I think this is the cutoff point. It could be two years into Islam. It could be five years into Islam. It all depends the amount of effort a person puts to be able to internalize the concepts and the understanding of Islam. So how much Quran are you willing to learn? Understanding, implementation, of course, because someone might be just theoretical and say, yeah, I understand everything about Islam, but like he doesn't do too much, right? So these are all important points. So once you've kind of entered into Islam and have uh, embraced Islam, uh, you know, positively and fully, I think then you can say I'm not no longer a new Muslim. For me, I would say it took me about five years. Okay, I would say it took me about five years to say, okay, I'm not really a new Muslim anymore. Um, some people, it takes them longer. Some people, subhanAllah, throughout, you know, after 20 years, they're still, they still consider themselves a new Muslim and they still haven't um, submerged themselves into the faith uh, fully. So it's hard to say, but I would, you know, so the, the new Muslim has to put quite a lot of effort to basically become a Muslim. Now, he's going to be a little bit different. And we see this throughout the history of Islam, that there was different cultures that, you know, entered Islam and they've adjusted some of their cultural practices to be in line with Islam. And some they've left because they were totally out of line with Islam. And some were kept because there was nothing wrong or there was nothing against Islam. Right? So Islam doesn't like wipe out your culture as some people might think. Okay, if I become Muslim now, I have to be Pakistani or Indian or this or Arab or that. Not necessarily. Does that mean that some these cultures don't have good elements? Mashallah, some people adopt the a certain culture. For example, um, they hang around with Arabs or with, you know, with Desi people from the subcontinent. And they love their culture and they adopt it. Like they start wearing their clothes and there's nothing wrong with it. If he, hey, if he feels like happy about it, you know, whatever, man. Like do whatever you feel that you are happy with and it, it fits you. You know, I remember meeting a, a Pakistani sister as part of one of our social projects. And she was married to, I'm sorry, she was a Mexican. She was Mexican and she married a Pakistani brother, you know. But you couldn't tell, like she was speaking fluent Urdu and, you know, all that. And I was like, my God, you know, subhanAllah. And she was like proper Pakistan, you know, but she was Mexican, you know what I mean? And it was quite interesting. But she just loved Pakistan and loved Urdu and loved, you know, uh, these things. So I was like, cool, whatever, you know, whatever floats your boat if you're happy. But if you want to obviously do the, um, the Islamic practices as well as have your culture as long as they don't conflict, you know, Bismillah, right? So, Alhamdulillah, I think, uh, yeah, this is this is basically one of the things that have to be considered when defining a new Muslim versus a Muslim only. And I do believe that the Ummah is very varied, you know, has a lot of, mashallah, different um, shades of different people. And that's what makes it beautiful. And that's what it was at the time of the Prophet as well. You had Salman al-Farsi, you had Suhaib al-Rumi, so Salman al-Farsi was from, from Persia. And Suhaib al-Rumi was from the Romans, <clears throat> from, right, from the Roman Empire. And you had Bilal al-Habashi, who was from Africa. And others from different tribes and different places. So it was not one homogeneous you know, kind of ummah. It was very heterogeneous. And, but they're all Muslims, and they all had their impact and their contributions uh, to the Ummah, subhanAllah, like Salman al-Farsi, he was the one who was at the gates during the Khalifa of Omar Khattab, 
at the gates of Persia, <laughs> telling them, you guys have, you know, pretty much three options. What do you want to choose, right? He's like, I'm from you guys, but he's like, I feel, he literally said, like, I feel bad for you, but like, this is the truth, you know what I mean? <laughs> so he's like advising them, right? Speaking to them in their language. Uh, mm. So subhanAllah, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing, right? This, this Ummah is beautiful, like the, the variety. So, yeah, I mean, for me, it took me five years, I would say, to really get over the initial stages and difficulties of being a new Muslim. And after that, it became much, much easier. So this is my theory. I think if you pass the five-year mark while doing and putting your effort that you have to do, then I believe, inshallah, from there on, it's, it's all good, alhamdulillah. I think at one point you had told us how long you were Muslim for. How long has it been? Uh, it's been 18 years now almost, yeah. MashaAllah. So, 18 years. And um, you said you wanted to write this book now for a long time. And it, even before you were Muslim, you said you wanted to write a book. Uh, so how long did it actually take you to write this book? And like, when did you make that decision? Like, ah, okay, it's time. Like, I, I feel like what I've been through is something that can potentially help. Okay. So I think, as I said, about two years into Islam, I said, I need to write. I started writing. Um, yeah, I think about two years, three years into Islam. So I think 2006 or seven. Um, I started, I was still writing and going through the process. I got some people to help me. I don't know if you guys remember, if you know Brother Sajid. I yeah, Sajid Lipham. Yeah, Sajid Lipham. He was the first one, a second one, I think, to edit my book. At that time, he was just, he just entered Islam, you know. <laughs> he just became a Muslim. Uh, you know, mashallah, after that, he went to Medina. And mashallah, he's got his, uh, mashallah, great channel now doing a lot of good work. But he was the, and he, that, I think his name was Rob. His name was Robert. And I even have the the initial copy that has edited by Rob Lipham, you know. It's quite cool. And I didn't I actually lost touch with him for a long time. He just recently, we reconnected about a year ago. But um, so it took me quite some time to write it. And I think it was an ongoing process because that's why I re, you know, remastered it or whatever. What was the term you used? Uh, yeah, remastered. It's a remastered copy. Mm -hmm. And I really put more time into it. 2019, 2020, you know, I said, you know, it's a lockdown. Let me just focus on finishing this. I've been putting it off. But also, I think it was so important to do it now after, you know, 17, 18 years of being a Muslim because I've had so much experience working with new Muslims within the social um organizations, social organizations of masajid and communities around the world. I've dealt with so many um, theological issues and social issues within these communities and running some of these new Muslim support projects that it really gave me a better insight, not only into my own experience, but into others and to connect to their experience and to find patterns, if that makes sense. So it was like, introspective but also analytical of mm -hmm. others and i think that was important because i didn't want it to be just subjective just to my experience and indeed i did find and i'm sure you've hear this a lot that a lot of the new muslim stories kind of have the same tune or there's a lot of the same type of you know stories that come together so doing this in 2020 it, it made a lot of sense because i could look back I could really analyze everything that I've gone through and others have gone through my experience and then talk to different people and they say, okay, this, these are some of the things that new Muslims go through in general. And these are maybe some of the things that I've gone through just as exceptions. But in, indeed, it was a great, I think it was just a, the perfect timing. And I had some help, like I invested some money in getting it edited properly by a new Muslim sister herself, mashallah, okay, who understood basically what I wanted to do as well. And that really helped a lot because, you know, she is a new Muslim and she's been Muslim for quite some time and she lives in, I think, in Morocco or something. 
and she's American. <clears throat> so there's a lot of connection there in terms of understanding what I'm trying to, what the spirit of the book, right? And she really did an amazing job. And yeah, Alhamdulillah. I mean, also I've had a designer to kind of arrange the book. And then we decided to put an e-format, e obviously, because with COVID right now, shipping things and whatnot, it's, it's a big mess. I said, you know what? I think this is my answer. Bismillah. Let's just do an e-book, easily accessible. And I've, one of the things that I've done to the book that was quite different was to put in a lot of pictures. Like I think every page has a personal picture in it that uh, has a caption that tells a story or is linked to whatever I'm talking about. From the time when I was a child, <laughs> family, friends, people who gave me shahada, I mean, the brother who gave me shahada, people who supported me early into my Islam, all these pictures are, are there. So it, there's kind of like a, a progression in, into my Islam with pictures that have a story behind it. So I think it makes it very personal. And I thought a lot about it, but subhanAllah, being an educator myself, and having been a teacher for a long time and a school principal and dealing with curriculum, the most important thing when telling a story is the connection, you know, being able to connect with people. And I believe that's where the, the subjectivity does play an important role because people want to know who you are and what's your story in this world and how did you make sense of things in this life. So that was something that really, I think, benefited those who read it and those who gave me feedback on it. So do you think, uh, well, not do you think, but any of the people that are about to embark in reading this book, are they going to catch any selfies of you in this book? Yeah, yeah there's, there's quite a few <laughs> selfies early in my uh, jahiliya before Islam, as well as early into Islam. So there's quite a lot of selfies here, alhamdulillah. I usually don't open up about my family too much on social media, but in this book, I did write a few things, like about my brother that passed away, about my family, my kids, stuff like that. I try to be very careful with that on social media usually. So I don't, mm -hmm. for those who follow me, I don't really post too much on that. But in this book, I did show a little bit because people said, look, man, we don't know anything about you. Like, why are you so <laughs> secret? I'm like, there's a reason for that. Um, but... I've kind of, you know, put a few things there about, you know, my mom who became Muslim as well, right? She became Muslim like two years after me. So she's been Muslim for about 15 years, right? <clears throat> and, you know, some of those struggles and alhamdulillah, you know. Yeah, yeah. so it, you, you're essentially feeding them scraps. I like that. Uh, but what I'm going to say is, uh, subhanAllah, I think it is the most perfect time for your book to actually be coming out because... I don't know if it's just me, but I feel like we're at a pivotal point where a lot of people have been uh, reverting to Islam. I mean, maybe it's the COVID, maybe it's the lockdown, maybe it's the times that we're in. I don't know what it is, but I really do think that it's a pivotal point. Yeah, yeah, no doubt, man. I was reading a book last night um, called The Dilemma of the Muslim Psychologist. And one of the points that the brother was making into in the book was the failure of the West, the materialistic Western philosophy to feed the soul. And he was saying that, and backing it up, that um, contemporary psychology as, and philosophy of, of the Western thought has failed to basically give humans a purpose mm -hmm. because materialistic philosophy doesn't give you a purpose people have achieved materialism and then they realize that okay i'm not happy and he said the i think he was quoting nietzsche you know where it was quite interesting i don't i mean i don't agree with nietzsche on many things he's quite a, a weird philosopher and has a lot of anti you know anti-faith but he says that give a man a purpose or if and he can deal with any what you know so, and I think that's a very profound statement. If you, ha if you have a purpose in life, like you can deal with anything. You can see that through, from uh, the people in Palestine right now who are being bombed and killed and they're still going. You know why they're going is because they believe in Allah. 
that's what makes them go. Because for them, this world is materialistic or materialism is just temporary and they have a higher purpose. Their why is the most important thing. And that's why they can deal with all these problems. And the same, when you look into the Muslim world, I think there was an article recently about the war in Yemen. And the guy was a non-Muslim. And he said something like, God lives in Yemen. Because he said, every person I interviewed were kind of like, Alhamdulillah, praise be to God. You know, thanks be to God every time. And like, and he's depressed. He said, I'm sitting around here looking at rubble and destroyed buildings and dead people. And they're saying, you know, praise be to God and thank God and all these things. Right? You know how the Muslims say, right? Alhamdulillah, inshallah, mashallah. We're always like positive with that. Subhanallah. So I think the world, as you said, Angel, right now, especially the Western world, is looking for a purpose. Now, this is where we come in, either with your podcast, you know, the three Muslims, and whatever we do. I know you got your YouTube and you're saying a lot of cool things there. Like this is our chance to reach out to people because the one thing that Islam gives, no doubt, it starts with that, is a purpose in life. That's the most beautiful thing. It's like no matter, when, when you have Iman in your heart, and we are you going to have a lot of issues and problems. It's not, problems are not going to go away. <laughs> Look at the Palestinians. They're believers. Why are they being bombed? You know, people can say, what's going on? I thought, if you're a believer now, things are going to be good. No, it's not like that. It's not like that. Sometimes the stronger the faith, the bigger the test. And we look at that. The prophets that, you know, past Old Testament prophets, Quran prophets, throughout the ages, these were the people that have gone through the bigger tests, the biggest tests, right? Because that's just the way it is. These, these, these tough times, they make strong men, you know? So the world is looking. I think we have the solution. I believe we have the solution to rid the world of anxiety, depression, and even more so lack of purpose. Mm. Lack of purpose. Now. Yeah, it reminds me of the verse in the Quran. Uh, do you think that just because you say you believe that you're not going to be tested? That is a perfect, perfect, yeah. perfect test there, man. Yes. So, so, Gabriel, I have a question for you. And this is for myself as well, but like, I have a feeling that a lot of viewers or a lot of people who are on the fence of getting this book of yours, um, what's something that really hit home for you as a reaver? You know, like when you were coming into Islam and you were learning, like you said, it took, for you, it took you about five years before you said, okay, um, I'm no longer a new Muslim. I feel like I'm pretty grounded in my faith. So, what is something that really stood out to you as a reaver that you could maybe share here for the people that are watching this episode so that they can have a little bit of insight, even more so as to what this book is going to bring them? Okay. <clears throat> Two things, inshallah. I talk about my spiritual experience um, in entering Islam. And I describe in this book a dream that I had. And I was a student of psychology at that time when I became Muslim. And one of the things that really, really fascinated me, and for those who understand the definition of psychology, is, is really the study of the, of the psych. And that is the spirit, actually, which modern psychology doesn't really address. But one of the things that... Uh, fascinated me within psychology was dream theories, you know? And I remember the dream that I had that pushed me actually to finally embrace Islam. Now, of course, it's a personal experience and it's subjective, but for me, it was like, it was a catalyst because I was going through so much intellectual stimulation and research at that time to understand what is Islam and why Islam is the truth. But I think I needed that spiritual push and it came through that dream. <clears throat> so that's one thing you can read about. And the second part is, 
is the learning process in Islam. And I was blessed to be able to, I think it was just a gift from Allah that someone took me under their wing at the beginning, a, you know, a scholar who was able to guide me and to teach me not just like what to think or what to learn, but also how to, what's the Islamic way of, of thinking and looking at the world and connecting to the verses of the Quran. And I remember we used to start, start our study circle just by one verse of the Quran or a couple of verses of the Quran, just really getting deep into it and, and connecting. And that was probably the most, the most powerful thing to connect to real life situations and to, to your life and whatnot. So yeah, these were a huge things for me that helped me early into my Islam to stay in Islam, to make the transition between being a new Muslim to a, you know, a Muslim and moving on to help others because that was the, subhanAllah, within the first few years, I was just, I don't know, Allah just pushed me into that field to support new Muslims and even existing Muslims in council. And, you know, I was one of the, the, the early social workers in our community. So, SubhanAllah, I was, I was like very, very early and fresh myself. I was still struggling myself, but I don't know, SubhanAllah, Allah just opened up that opportunity. The community was looking at me saying, you're a new Muslim. You've had experience with these things. You do it. And I was like, I looked around, there's no one else doing it. And I said, all right, Bismillah, let's jump, you know. So Alhamdulillah, I don't regret it. It was just, an, it was part of, my development and being who I am today. And have I not had those experiences? I just, I don't think I would have been here today. Uh, I, got, I got two things to say. One, salam alaikum to Rami. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Ahlan wa sahlan. Bil habib. Habib. And number two, simply put, we know all guidance is from Allah alone, but if all other variables are the same, if you got two people, one, they don't read your book. And they're new Muslim. The second one, they do read your book. What is the difference between them? Assuming all other variables are the same. Right. I think for those who read my book, I give some practical uh, solutions on how to deal with some of the problems of doubts, for example, which are inevitable as a new Muslim. No doubt you will have doubts. <laughs> <laughs> It's just the way it is, bro. It's like, it's part of, of the process. Because you have, you know, istiqama or thibat or consistency and lack of doubt comes from knowledge. And a new Muslim doesn't really have all that knowledge when he enters Islam. So there's going to be a bunch of questions. Plus, Satan is like on your head knocking you day and night because he's very upset that you've actually chosen Islam. So there's going to be a lot of whispers and thoughts that are going to come to you and you're going to have thoughts about Islam that are very negative. You can even, sometimes you cannot even talk to someone. And that is one of the issues that I address in my books is that my experience opening up to some of the scholars or some of the, and how they reacted to me, uh, which I think was very negative because they just didn't understand where I was coming from. You know, and it was the same as the priest did when I was, a, you know, when I was in Catholic school. In high school, right, when I had an, a question about the Trinity and they're just like, no, you cannot ask these questions. These are from the devil and all that, you know, and I didn't question. I was asking a question. There's a difference, you know, between questioning and asking a question. Asking a question is about I just want to know. You want to understand. You're seeking truth sincerely. So I think if they read my book, I address some of these critical issues that a lot of people try to put under the carpet because they don't, they feel it's embarrassing. You know, it's like, oh, an issue of doubt. Oh, you don't believe in Islam. Oh, what are you, a non-Muslim? Oh, this and that. Um, issues of identity, culture, seeking knowledge, traveling, things that a lot of new Muslim marriage, okay, a lot of that is there. A lot of the things that new Muslims will encounter within the first few years of their Islam. So I think by telling my story and giving some of the practical tips that I do, it will save them a lot of headache, you know? Because again, remember, it's not just my experience, it's connected to a lot of other new Muslims experience. So it's like, okay, it's like a theory that you can practice and hopefully it'll save you some time and save you some 
depression, some anxiety that I've had going through these things and dealing with these things. So it's like a, you know, alhamdulillah, a good shortcut, inshallah, that uh, will help you to maybe accelerate your, you know, transition from new Muslim to Muslim so you can help the community and the world and give them your best earlier and faster, inshallah. Mashallah. Just listen to all this. Like, it, it's instantly relatable. And I'm not just saying it. Like, as you're saying it, I'm just like, ah, yeah, like, I can see that. Like, especially when you said that uh, going up to a sheikh and then saying something and just feeling like you can't really go to anyone because they're not really understanding where you're coming from. Um, I do feel that 100%. I do feel that. So a question that I had is you said that you personally had, you had someone that took you under their wing. Do you feel like that's something that's very important for reverts? Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Uh, first and foremost, because it's a prophetic approach to education. That's exactly what the Prophet wasallam did as soon as anyone entered Islam. And not just that, he established a system. So he would teach the companions. And then those, once they were strong enough, then they would start teaching. It became a system. Even when the great Arabia entered Islam, he would always send a Sahaba, a companion, to move and to live with those people. Like literally, they would just totally move there to Iraq, to Syria, wherever they were where the, Islam, the, the empire, Islamic empire would spread, he would always send someone who was grounded in the faith, who understood the challenges to basically be with the people and guide them and you know, nurture them and so on. And it was a nurturing process. It was not just an educational process. There was, it was a 360-degree system, mashallah. So it is definitely a prophetic process that I think it's not apply today and i've worked with many masajid or mosques in canada usa uh, middle east all over the world the only place where i've seen till today we're struggling with this till today new muslim support services are quite weak throughout canada and i'm not sure if you guys know in toronto coach zubair maybe that's someone i would recommend you guys do uh a little podcast with uh, he's he's in Toronto and he works with new Muslims and he can definitely tell you how things are in Toronto on the ground there with new Muslims but um, we're still way be, way 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 you know like behind what we're supposed to be when it comes to new Muslim support groups and how to find a correct system, which is based on prophetic tradition, I would say, that takes in consideration the culture, everything that happens, uh, who these people are, and takes them under their wing and helps them and then puts them back out in society to help others. And that's the whole point. One of, as my teacher was saying, he said the da'wah or this faith is like, this movement is like a hospital, you know? You kind of treat people and then you release them, you discharge them and let them go back in society and start doing their thing. It's not a hotel where people check in and out and do whatever they want. It's not a jail where you lock people. It's not, you know, it's, it's got a, he, that's what he compared to. He says like a hospital, you know, we heal people spiritually. We support them morally, physically, whatever, uh, socially. And then boom, once they're ready, you know, let them be out there and start more small projects like this and help other people. So it's critical to have someone to take you under their wing and support you and guide you. Someone who understands, who has wisdom, not only knowledge, because if you look through the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he blames people who have knowledge but no wisdom. And actually, the comparison that's given is quite a harsh comparison as donkeys who have books on their back, right? Because it's just carrying weight of knowledge, but no correct application or wisdom of that knowledge. So I think that is key, inshallah. Do you think that even born Muslims should also uh, have someone take them under their wing? Because, I mean, there's a lot of born Muslims that... Uh, 
they're pretty much on reverse status. Mm, that's a good point. I like that reverse status. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe so, man. Because the only difference is, I think, with the people who are born into Islam, into Muslim families anyway, we're all born Muslims, is the nurturing that takes place that kind of gets internalized. So it's kind of in, in their identity. Um, yes, people who are born into Muslim families do leave Islam, do apostate and do become even, you know, sometimes worse than non-Muslims. But in general, I think those who have been raised as Muslims still have that identity. Like I'm a Muslim, no matter what, you know what I mean? Even if I'm a bad person or I do weird things, I'm still a Muslim. But indeed, they do need that support because this prophetic approach is, is for everyone, not just new Muslims. Uh, indeed, indeed, the Sahaba of the Prophet Sallallahu pretty much all of them, except for a few, they were born and still lived with the Prophet as children and as young men. But most of the big Sahabas that we know, they're all converts. All of them are reverts or converts. Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, Ali, uh, all of them are reverts. And that's, that's why I think it's very important to understand the early lives of the Sahaba when dealing with new Muslims. And I think many people don't know how to make that connection. So yeah, just to answer your question, I think both reverts as well as born Muslims into Muslim families, they all need that wing to protect them because it is a, a prophetic approach that covers everyone, inshallah. Mashallah. So... Are you taking anyone under your wing anytime soon? Bismillah, <laughs> yes. Alhamdulillah. I have a few people, alhamdulillah, under my wing. And Mashallah. Yeah, we are always trying to, to have a system to help people to, uh, to continue their journeys uh, through Islam and to become people who will take people under their wing to nurture people who are going to take people under their wing. That's that's what we're trying to do, inshallah. Inshallah. Well, I think that was beautiful. I think if Fayed and Rami don't have anything to ask, I think the only question to ask is where can we get the book? Okay, inshallah. So in all my videos or my posts, I link the book, the uh, site to purchase the book. You can see the the uh you know just the description of the book the pictures some samples and then you can just order it and alhamdulillah all the people whoever orders it basically all the money goes to supporting and, and creating and generating more dao inshallah more invitations to islam to others more videos more more work so alhamdulillah it's definitely a great investment inshallah inshallah Ready here first, invest in your Akhara. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And if I remember correctly, I, I, I think I read this somewhere. It's starting to get kind of dark in here, so I'll turn the light on. But um, oh, I don't know if it was uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that said this, or if it was just something that's, uh, I guess, encouraged. But like the, the best things that you can do in this life I think one of them was like, leave something that will continue on after you, that will continue to help you. Great. Yeah, that is a beautifully said. It is hadith, as you correctly say. The yeah. Prophet Sallallahu said that uh, it's like beneficial knowledge. It is a sadaqa jari or perpetual uh, uh, you know, benefit that will be even after you're gone. And one of them is leaving beneficial knowledge for people so people can benefit from it. books, videos, podcasts, yeah. whatever, you know, can be after we're gone. Inshallah, all these things will still be there, you know, available for people. People make dua for us. You yeah. know, people will, you know, benefit from us. And it's like the bank account in the Akhirah keeps increasing, inshallah, just from, from these things. All right, <laughs> that was deep. That was some deep silence there. Mm -hmm. I was looking at Rami the entire time. 
I know. Me I too, thought Robbie bro. was going to say something. He looked like he was going to say something. Like I was like, bro, unmute yourself. forward a little bit. Well, actually, look, oh, I was going to say something. Uh, I'm, yeah. like, I'm like dead right and now. And what's on my mind? What's up? Mm. When Unhealth first reverted, and we used to do like episode one, two, like the OGs, right? This man could not sit down for more than five minutes, pacing around the room. What reminded me of that was those two little things hanging down from his fan. And he, that was always his view. He was just walking around. But I haven't seen him do that a lot, like recently. That's because so, I have it on the tripod right now. But do you still feel that instinct to like go walk around, pace around? Were you controlling it? Lot. I'm controlling. Well, I'm doing a horrible job of controlling it, but I'm, I'm trying. It's like, do any of you have ADHD? Yes, sir. Mm. So you okay? You guys understand, Rami? I think you I, have it too. I use, Maybe not. I use this thing. I, it's right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm either it's like right. messing around with like my uh, my joggers like lace thing, or I'm just yeah. like I'm grabbing something. And if I'm not grabbing anything, if I'm not moving. Like my head is just like all over the place, and I'm really not yeah. paying attention. You gotta fidget. I know. I I use my legs. I you cannot see it right now, but they're moving like this. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I do the same. I do the same. But this this thing helps me a lot, though. Like if I'm tired or if I'm really like reading or doing something, I'll just be snapping. Uh-huh. <laughs> see, you reminded me like I used to when I first started this uh the whole no fat thing when I had an issue. I had a rubber band on my wrist, and any time that I would feel like, you know, going back, I would just snap myself really hard. It didn't work. <laughs> but it, it's nice for, like, a fidgeting thing, though. I'll be honest. Yeah, fidgeting is good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah. What y'all right, see in this episode? Yeah, let's end this one. It's been beautiful. Um, we're going to leave a link in the description box down below where you guys can get this man's book. You guys can read it, inshallah. It'll help you whether you're a revert or not. I know I'm going to read it. I know Fire is going to read it. And Rami has to read it now. Inshallah, bro. And inshallah. I feel like if you like it, you know, send the link as well to someone else so they can get it. That would benefit, inshallah. Keep yeah. the blessings going. Keep yeah. the baraka going. Yeah. Inshallah. All right, Rami, end it up, bro. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. All right, pardon me for my absence for most of the uh, the episode, but uh, I know these guys held it down, mashallah. So, everybody watching, uh, Jazakallah khair. Remember to share this with a friend, inshallah. Remember to uh, publicize this book and comment to help promote our videos on YouTube. It really does make a difference. And if you want to continue to support us, then consider becoming a member of our Patreon, the lowest tier being $5 a month. With that being said, Allahumma atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa kina adab anar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa Mm-hmm.